My castaway this week is Whoopi Goldberg, a successful actor, comic, and producer. She made her name in the colour purple, and won her Oscar for Ghost. It was bound to happen. Even as a child, she used to practice making acceptance speeches. And today, she's one of only a handful of people to have won an Oscar, a Grammy, a Tony, and Emmy awards. Yet, despite her success, she is perhaps an uncomfortable role model. The only person she wants to please, she says, is herself. An observant and quick child, she was also headstrong. She married young, had a child early. Then she wrote her own sketch show. It found its way onto Broadway, and her career was launched. I was in the right place at the right time, seen by the right person, she says, and spectacular things happened. Well, they surely did, Whoopi Goldberg. Um, <laughs> you were seen by the right person back in what was it, the the nineteen eighties, and that yeah. right person was Steven Spielberg. Is it right? Did you do a sort of private performance for him, or yes? You, yes. What was <laughs> that? Tell me about that. I'm intrigued. He asked if I would mind bringing the Broadway show to him, and since it was just me, it felt like it would be all right. So I went and. Before I went in, they said to me, now, we want you to do whatever you want to do, whatever piece you want to do, but we also know you do a piece called Blee T, which was about the black E.T. And they said, we don't think that would be a good idea. And I said, okay, whatever, you you know, that's fine with me. There's nothing in it that's bad. <laughs> so I do the show. I walk out and I come out onto what I think is just a private stage and Everyone that, for me at the time, you know, like Ashford and Simpson and Michael Jackson and Quincy Jones, see, those are the people who are sitting in the <laughs> sitting in the audience, oh. friends of Stevens. And so I do my show, and they're very happy. But they say more, 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 and I say, well, I have more, but I've been asked not to do this piece. And Stevens said, well, why? I said they said you would be uh, annoyed. Because it's really, it's about E.T., the black E.T., what would happen if he landed, instead of in a very nice neighborhood, if he landed, say, like in Oakland? He said, oh, I want to see it. I said, are you, are you absolutely sure? Because <laughs> I, I don't want to upset you. He said, no. So I did it. And he laughed and laughed and laughed. And I thought, oh, first lesson of the world. Ask the person directly. Mm -hmm. Don't let someone else tell you that it's not going to work for somebody else. You should ask them. Were you in any way aware that this was An some sort of audition? No. 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 Well, and was it? Yeah. Right. It seemed um, striking to me when I saw uh, The Colour Purple that uh, the role, the list of names went up of the mm -hmm. cast at the beginning. And, of course, one has the impression that this is an epic movie. You're about right. to see something right. big. Key, though, to the titles coming up, it said and introducing yes. Whoopi Goldberg. Now, yes. this was your first ever yes. movie role. Yes. That was, for the times, anachronistic. I mean, that was something that people might have done in the movies in the 40s and 50s. R really, you're saying to the yeah. audience, here is a fully formed star. Yeah. You are going to love her. Yeah. That's quite a pressure for yeah. a performer. Well, fortunately, <laughs> I didn't see it till much later. <laughs> <laughs> but the great thing about that is that it, you can only have that once in your life. Sure. Because it does mean something. It really does mean something. So finally, when I saw the film and saw it come up, I just started l quietly just kind of laughing under my breath, going, wow.
Alice Walker wrote the book. Is it true right. that you wrote to Alice Walker yes. when you read the book? Yes. What did you say in your letter? I said, you know, my name is Whoopi Goldberg, and I'm a performer in San Francisco, California, and this is a great book. And if uh, they ever make a movie, I'd like to be, you know, in it. I'd like to play the dirt. That's how much I like this. And so I sent her my resume and stuff. And a couple of months later, I had been invited to New York, and I stayed with my mom. And she said, oh, so some mail came for you. She handed me a purple envelope that said Alice Walker on it. And I opened it up and it basically said, Dear Whoopi, I live in San Francisco. I know your work. I already sent your stuff to them. Wow. Wow. Now, no matter what, it doesn't matter if anything happens. She sent my stuff out. That's pretty good. about your first piece of music then today. What have you chosen? Uh, the first piece is Bill Withers. I love Bill Withers and Lovely Day. And I love Lovely Day because it's just a positive song. When someone else instead of me Always seems to know the way Then I look at you And the world's all And I know it's gonna be a lovely day. Bill Withers and Lovely Day. You were just blissed out. I was. That. I love it. It was washing song. over you with its loveliness. Yeah. You know, it's. A, I remember when my kids were small, you know, that's a song that I would whisper to them when they were babies. Now they're grown people and I whisper other things to them. But this is a song that they, they loved as well. What about when you were small then? You were born in 1955, mm-hmm. just a couple of weeks before Rosa Parks yes. sat on the bus. Yes. It's really interesting that your life has sort of been lived in parallel yes. with all of those incredibly significant those moments in civil moments. rights history. Yeah. And also my other favorite moment of 1955, the opening of Disneyland. You know, <laughs> Disneyland and Mickey Mouse and I. We're hanging out in our 53rd year. You're looking better than he is. I, I think so, too. Um, so the early days then, you were brought up in uh, Manhattan, mm-hmm. right yeah. in the centre of where it was all happening. Yeah. And you have a brother, Clyde. I have a, my, I have my big brother, Clyde, who, when he walks down the street, has his own theme music. He's cool, isn't He's he? the coolest person I know. And your mother, and not your father, your father no, left. No, not my dad. But my mom. And your, was your dad, a, was he a, a minister or a preacher? Was he yeah, like? he went through many, many incarnations. He was many, many things. <laughs> He's many things. And your mother, a strong woman. Pretty strong, you know, very sensitive and really brilliant, but no place for her at the time, you know, no place for her to be. So she uh, went from being a practical nurse to being a Head Start teacher to getting her master's in early childhood education. Was it a tough upbringing? I mean, was the neighborhood tough? No, people... 
Every time I talk about it, I always laugh because people say, Yon, you came up to degradation of it. <laughs> I actually didn't. I came up in a really good neighborhood that was not wealthy. It was a poor neighborhood. You know, we lived in a, what you call the council houses. Yeah, council houses. You know, yeah. we call them the projects. And in New York, no one ever said, oh, you poor, poor children. You know, Christmas and Hanukkah and all those holidays came and we got gifts. I don't know how she did it, but she did it, you know. My mother was very practical, is very practical. And her response to me on the big questions of the teenage years and the adult years, can you live with your choice? If you can't live with your choice, if you're concerned other people aren't going to like you because of your choice, then it's not the choice that you want to make. If you don't care if other people like you and your choice, then you'll be all right. And when your mother got her master's, then when was that? Is, was that, that decades later? Or? Yeah, right. yeah, probably early 90s. That must have been an incredibly proud moment f- for you in a kind of reverse. Well, she didn't tell me. <laughs> My mother, you know, she's one of those in the, the old school parents that you exist only on a need-to-know basis. Like you'd say, how old are you? And she'd say, why do you need to know? <laughs> so how did you find out she got her master's? I heard a rumor and called her. And said, I heard that you just graduated from uh, NYU with a master's degree. She said, yeah. Were you going to tell me? She said, yeah. When you needed to know, I would have let you know. I mean, she's like that. About uh, disc number two, what have we got? Uh, well, Van Morrison, you know, I just, I love him. And this is another song that that is about positiveness. Jackie Wilson said, it was written to you. kind of love you got to knock me off my feet. Let it all hang out. Oh, let it all hang out. Yeah, you know, I'm so wild. Van Morrison and Jackie Wilson said, uh, Whoopi Goldberg, you or you were dyslexic, you are dyslexic. Are dyslexic. I suppose you never stop being no, dyslexic. No, you're always dyslexic. But at school, 
I imagine that made things incredibly difficult. Well, they assumed I was being lazy because I was, I was so smart in other ways. There were things I could do and I could remember things. And so they knew I wasn't dumb. Mm-hmm. They just thought I was being lazy. And you, you, didn't, you didn't go to senior school at all, did you? No, no. I hated school. And your mum was fine with that? Well, she said, you better find something else to do. So what did you do when you were 12, 13, 14? In those days, you could go to uh, the Museum of Modern History, and they gave lectures, daily lectures. And as long as I got a daily lecture there or I went to the uh, New York Public Library, as long as I was going places where learning was occurring, she was fine. I was very lucky to have a mother who got it. She understood something was different about me. So you had this kind of bespoke homeschooling, in, in essence. In a, you, yeah. you were sort of fashioning it yeah. yourself. City schooling, let's okay, call it. Okay, yeah. And you were shy. Yes. Really? Still. I know it's shocking. It, well, it just seems unlikely, I that's know. all. I know, yeah. I just, I'm, I'm never comfortable in, in big crowds because I don't know... I'm not, I don't have a big spectrum of conversation, <laughs> you know. But you talk very easily. You talk very fluidly. You don't seem to trip on your words or your no, thoughts. No, but I'm, if I'm in a group of people, I don't have much to say. I'm wondering then about the woman I saw presenting the Oscars a few years ago. Cause that well, ga- that's Whoopi Goldberg, yeah. She can do anything. She can talk to anybody. But there is a, an aspect which is sort of the the me that that nobody knows the aspect of myself which uh isn't as comfortable with all of that so i just let Whoopi do the work let's hear your next track then Nusrat Ali Khan i first heard him on a a Peter Gabriel World album and there was this voice on it that just i don't want to sound too like you know, silly, but it just filled me with light, you know, and I knew that somehow this man or this voice was channeling the spirit and the spirit of whatever God you believe in. When this man sings, I just know that, you know, there's something greater than me in the world. So that's why I love it. And the piece is called Shamhun Doha, I think it's pronounced. And I love it. Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan and Shamas Adoa. Uh, tell me, Whoopi Goldberg, about the drugs. When did the drugs happen? Because they were in your teenage years. Yeah. Well, they happened all. <laughs> they <laughs> happened a lot and often through a lot of years. You know, I know it's really not PC to say, but you know, at the time when I was growing up, it was perfectly great. Uh, experimenting with things like LSD and. You know, talking about mind expansion and uh, heroin was a, a a drug that that took you to places that you'd never been before. It was for me a a really good learning time. I don't recommend it to anybody because the rough part about it is it wants to stay with you, you know, and you want it to because you you find that it's easier to live outside of life. And for me. I actually like living. So it really came down to, okay, if you go down this path and Mm. stay here, pretty much you're going to die. It's a given fact. And, you know, your teeth are going to fall out. You're going to be on the street, probably living the life of a prostitute. Or if you go this way and you find other things that give you the same feeling, a good piece of music... (laughs) nice person on occasion, you might live a little longer. And so I experimented and I enjoyed my time in the experimental stage. And then I, you know, cleaned up, got married, had a baby, and that sort of put the kibosh on getting 
fucking high anymore. And I don't drink. You know, I've, I've now become ex- incredibly boring. There's only one drug that scares me, and that's an opium. You know, opium is one of those drugs that if I ever fell into it again, I'd never come out. But, you know, it's hard to be high in the streets now because I'm, I've been Whoopi Goldberg for so long that I think drooling when somebody wants an autograph probably isn't the most attractive thing. It's not a, it's not a good look. <laughs> probably not. Mm, you go to my head And you linger like a horn and refrain And I find you spinning round in my brain Like a bubble in a glass of champagne You go to my head Like a sip of sparkling burgundy brew And I find the very mention of you Like a kicker in a Julie Bird too Oh, the thrill of the thought That you might give a thought To my plea, cast a spell over me Still I said to myself Get a hold of yourself Can't you see that it never can be Yes You go to my head With a smile that makes my temperature rise Like a summer with a thousand July You intoxicate my soul with your eyes By Papa said, though I'm certain That this heart of mine has no ghost of a chance in this crazy romance you go to my head you go to my head you go to my head. Talk there about uh, getting married and having a child. You did that mm. very young. Yeah, 18. Not very young. Not very young. I thought it no. was, I'd read it was younger than that. Of course, no, these my things my daughter are, right. had her child young. How young was she? She was 14 when she got pregnant and 15 when she had the baby. Was that tricky? No, not if you believe in choice. And that was the choice she made. And my mom and I said, you know, then we'll help you do this. And now the kid's 19, just like her mom, funny, is not did not get pregnant, thank you. And uh, she got, uh, Alex, my daughter, got married and had been married for like 10 or 12 years and had two more kids and, you know. So you were a grandmother in your 30s, yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. How did that sit? I mean, with your sense of self. Well, I was not... good looking. I have to say, I was a good looking grandma. I was the, I was a hottie. <laughs> Let's take a break for another piece of music. What okay. have you chosen? Actually, it's kind of funny, apropos of what we're talking about. Judy Collins. It's who knows where the time goes. It just, it's a reminder. You only get a specific amount of time. You don't know when or how much, but it's finite and. You know, you got to pay attention, and that's what this song is about, paying attention. Across the morning sky All 
Judy Collins and who knows where the time goes. Uh, Whoopi Goldberg, I know what we get from you performing. You know, we love to watch you. We love to have you make us laugh and to entertain us and engage us. What do you get from performing? I get life. I get life from performing. It's like a battery. <laughs> I, I feel like when, I, when I'm working, I'm plugged in and I'm charged and I'm attuned to everything that's around me. There's huge expectation, of course, on a star when they walk into a room, any room, whether it's, you know, a restaurant where you've got Mm -hmm. to be nice to the waiter Mm because the waiter's meeting Whoopi Goldberg that day. That's what he's going to go home and tell his wife. Yeah. As soon as you come out of your house, you have to be Whoopi Goldberg. Hard work? Um, Sometimes, from time to time, it can be very difficult because I can be cranky. You know, and then you become that Whoopi Goldberg who gave me a bad tip, right. or who was rude so to me, or I have to really map my brain to find polite ways to do things. When did you start performing? I think moments after I left the womb. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story my mother tells. Really? So you were yeah. one of those kids dancing on the kitchen table, saying, "Look oh, at yeah. me! Look at me!" Yeah. I love the idea that you could be any number of things. And to me, that's what acting was. It meant being able to get into some sort of virtual pod and time travel. And you didn't, as far as I understand it, then you didn't start auditioning, doing the traditional things. You, you wrote for yourself and you yeah. performed for yourself. Why yeah. did you make that choice? That's, that's quite a difficult thing to choose. To well, do. because I thought no one will ever, there's nothing that exists that I know of that will show what I think I can do. So I might as well write myself stuff to say so people can can see me doing it. And it evolved into writing these characters. And basically when you go into audition, you're just supposed to do a a monologue. So Mm -hmm. I I wrote myself monologues to do that I knew I could do well. Let's take a break for some music then. Track number uh, five. Yes, it's Stevie Wonder. One of the great songs, greatest songs ever written, Superstition. Do you know Stevie Wonder? Yeah. I what, love Stevie. What's he like? He's a big old guy. He's a big old guy who is just... Genius is not even the word. It's just... He's like a walking musical note. And he's very funny. You know, he's, he's the greatest. He's delicious. Very superstitious. Stevie 
wonder and superstition. Were you very at home when, when the doors opened to the club of, of A-listers, you know, the colour purple and your Oscar nomination and you won a Golden Globe for it? There you were. You were now in the club and the mm. doors shut behind you and you were one of those people right. who can look across a room at those other people and think, well, I'm one of you now. Did it feel right? Well, it felt OK because I was in New York with Mike Nichols and Garson Kanan and I would be able to sit and talk to Garson about the movies that they wrote for Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn. And then they would call, you know, Jack Lemon and say, you know, now Whoopi's coming, and so would you have her to lunch? So I got to spend time with Jack Lemon and Walter Matthau. You know, I would be at dinner with uh, Gregory Peck and Sidney Poitier, and my brain would be going... You know, what about being defined by your colour in Hollywood? Did you feel that that was too important or not important enough or shouldn't have been important but was? Well, I would say to people, you know, it's like, how do you feel about being white? Yeah. What what goes through your mind? And they'd say, well, I never think it was, well, you know, it just is. Of course it just is, but I think if you're a minority, I mean, I know, you know, as a Scottish person, Mm -hmm. when I first came to live in London... I felt different because I was well, a Scottish person living in London. because you were Scottish. <laughs> exactly. <I'm... laughs> now, other people would tell me that it was. I've got you. And, I, and what I was trying to say was, I would say, well, I never, I don't think about, you don't think about being Scottish, you just are. Yeah. But it's not until somebody goes, my God, you're Scottish. Do you go, oh, yeah, my God, I'm Scottish. It doesn't. Well, somebody did once ask me, are you going to read the news in that voice? And I said, well, it's the only one. It's the, yeah. Got. I mean, yes, it's I like, what did you think? I, you know, I would say to people, you look surprised that I'm black. I mean, you knew, didn't you? I mean, all the move. I wasn't Chinese yesterday and, turn, you know. What then about being, because, of course, uh, I can't imagine that people didn't then expect you because you were in this exalted role and you were not typical of all of the stars we normally see to be the role model that you know you have to be the role yeah I never thought I should be I never thought I could be and so I always just kind of laughed and said come on you don't really want your kids emulating me do you but you know I, I always think people say to me you know for black youth in particular and I'd say, well, basically, I'm just going to stay black. How's that? <laughs> that'll, that'll be my example <laughs> of what to do. But I, I'm not a big believer that your kids should have role models outside of their parents. I think the first role models uh, you should have are the people who are raising you. And if they're not good role models, then you look outside. questions come to my mind, but I'm going to wait to ask them until after the next piece of music. What have you chosen? I've chosen my queen, Celia Cruz. She was Cuban. She was amazing. She was a teacher originally and also wanted to sing. And her parents, who were very strict, said, no, 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 no. If you go into 
performing, if you become a singer, you can never come home again. And unfortunately, the revolution happened almost simultaneously as her going out as a singer and she never got to go home. So I I revere her because she stood for who she was. She knew that she had to do her art. And this is the truth. The price for doing you can sometimes be very, very, very high. And also, I love Latin music. I love to dance. And so whenever Celia comes on, you know, I just dance my little behind off. Celia Cruz and Kimbara. Uh, you said... I as love we... that you're talking with this very calm voice. Nobody knew you were in here just dancing. You're behind <laughs> off, too. Yeah. It's radio. That's, That's the beauty right. of radio. <laughs> um, you said, as we were going into that piece of music, that the price for being you, for being an artist, can be very high. What's, mm. the, what's the price been for you? Oh, friendships and relationships and... Things that end in ships. <laughs> <laughs> You've been married three times. Yeah. But, you know, I'm just... The truth is I'm just not very good at it. I love the wedding part. Because okay. I love... You know, everybody's always happy. But it's the day after that I have trouble with. Mm -hmm. Is it true that at one of your weddings you said when the vows were read out and you were meant to say, I do, you said maybe? Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> Perhaps, I th I know. And what is it, the little things? Is it having to compromise? It... It's having to think about someone else constantly who isn't a child. I don't think love should be executed as a duty. You shouldn't have to feel like if you don't respond a certain way... It goes against the grain of relationship because the couple isn't always coupling. You must have time alone. So do you think, I mean, will there be, would there be a fourth Mr. Goldberg or is that, have you given up oh, on Oh, no, that? there'd be no Mr. There's never been a Mr. Goldberg. And, and part of that is what people do. You know, people are cruel when the woman is the more famous. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I was sort no, of no, I know you, I, making I that knew, point. Yeah. But, you know, outside of this room, people are mean. They people do get lost in your mm. celebrity. Mm. And it's a terrible place for a guy to be, you know. Often, though, if he's a fully formed person, it rolls off his back. But those fully formed people are generally married to other people. <laughs> Damn. Is, is it true you live in the middle of nowhere? I mean, when you're not yeah. working? Where, yeah. I mean, without being too specific, clearly, I don't I want to... in Vermont. To... Okay. Oh, right, yeah. so... In, in, in the rural cold, wilderness. Cold, desolate from I, It's not desolate. It's, it's actually quite wonderful. I live out in the middle of nowhere because I like it. Tell me about your next piece of music then, Ruby. Well, it's Amy Winehouse. I love this little girl. But this song, Me and Mr. Jones, is so reminiscent of the music I grew up with, listening to my mother listening to the music. She has the phraseology, she has the feel, she's just she's just terrific and I love it and it contains a brilliant question. <laughs> Enjoy that. I, I love I love this girl. I just that talent is so great. We've come this far, Ruby Goldberg, and I've not got much more time to talk to you. And I know you're over in, in London because you're producing a sister act, which is going to be yes. on stage. Yes. Here. Do you the role of producer, is that one that sits easily with you? Yeah, I like it. I like it. I don't mind it at all. It's a lot more relaxing. Is it? Than <laughs> yeah. performing. Yeah. Yeah. Because you go, Yeah, I like that. 
And then you go on with your life. Um, <laughs> as easy as that. It's as for me, yeah. Do, do you like leading a team? Are you quite a sort of somebody who likes to control what's happening? No, I like to be part of a team. I like to be part of a team. I like, I I don't like being the figurehead because then it's all on you. Uh, one of the things that I've come to realize is that careers evolve. And who I was 22, 23 years ago is not who I am now. And so you have to ride the wave of your career and as you do with your life. So if there's a movie that I want to do, I, you know, I, I'm sure it'll find me. And is it that you get offered movies that you think that's just no, not for me or you no. just don't get offered movies? No, I never used to get off. I never got offered movies. All the movies I've made were other people's movies, except for Color Purple, which is written specifically with me in mind. By um, So Sister Mena. Act was for somebody else? Yeah, Sister Act was uh, put together for Bette Midler. Jumpin' Jack Flash was put together for Shelley Long. Uh, Ghost? What about Ghost? Ghost was written for, I think, a woman called Teresa Wright. But they wouldn't let me audition for Ghost. It wasn't until Patrick Swayze said, I am not doing this movie unless you audition her. So that's how I got Ghost. But it wasn't for me. And uh, and so when you won the Oscar for it, did you go up and shake it in their faces? and say, No, Look what I got. but I thanked Patrick and yeah. said, you know, if not, I owe this Oscar to Patrick Swayze. And he knew what I meant. Before we go into the next piece of music then, as you know, this is Desert Island Discs and I'm going to cast you away onto a desert island. I'm imagining that because Vermont and where you go to mm-hmm. be lonely and happiest uh, is a choice for you, that being on a desert island might be quite nice. Would no, be very nice. Wouldn't get lonely? Would you get lonely? Um, If I had some sort of animal, I'd be all right. Like if there was like a, a mountain lion or something that was around. Or a cat or a dog or something. So tell me why you've chosen track eight, and then we'll come to that other side. Well, Joan Sutherland and Jane Burby singing the flower duet from Lakme is just... I want to weep at their ability to do this, to be able to sing like this, because there's something pure in it. There's something pure in these particular voices for me that doesn't exist anywhere else. And... When you have two voices that can dance this way, it's pretty spectacular.
Joan Sutherland and Jean Berbet singing the flower duet from Lacme by Delib. So, Whoopi Goldberg, we come to the moment then where I give you the Bible and the complete works of Shakespeare, mm-hmm. and you can take another book onto the island with you. What's your book going to be? The, the book I would take with me, actually, is Letters to a Young Poet, because that's what I carried with me over here. It's just great. It's yours. And also, I'm going to give you a luxury to make life a little more bearable on this island, on Mm. your own. What luxury would you like? I believe I would like to have some wise potato chips. As many cases as you want. They're yours. Fab. (laughs) I'm coming back here. (laughs) And if you had to choose just one disc, if the waves were to threaten to wash to the shore and uh, take them away, which one would you save? I think I would probably save Lovely Day. Goldberg, thank you very much for letting us hear your Desert Island Discs. Thank you. My pleasure. 